things. I've never, um, I was brought up a Christian, but it was, it was very much my choice. And there were things I didn't understand or that might not have completely jived with me, you know, kind of like those, you know, moments when you're being taught something that you're completely supposed to accept, but that you don't completely, it doesn't completely just, uh, there's not an understanding, there's not a knowing that, that's, that's, that's is true in the way that you're interpreting it. So when I hear words like channeling, I'm like, whoa, this is like freaky, you know, way out there stuff, that's like got to be, you know, I mean, this is the old, the old Christian stuff would be like alarm, alarm, that's probably a demon, that's like the devil talking through, so, and I, it's just, because of a very strict belief system, it's not that I truly believe that, I just don't know what the definition of channeling is, so could you define that? So it's kind of a, it, I don't allow the, I don't feel the panic with it, but I do kind of get this little like judgment on the back of my head, kind of like, what does that mean? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, again, everything comes back to, to the inspired use of symbols, so, uh, when, when someone gives an inspiring talk, we can say, oh, that was an inspiring talk or a lecture. Um, when uh, we have the Unity Church, which is kind of a, a denomination of Christianity that's kind of known for being very open-minded and, and so forth, um, actually back in the, I think it was back in the 1990s, the Unity uh, Board of Directors got together in uh, Missouri and decided that uh, they didn't want any Course in Miracle books in Unity churches. Uh, they wanted them banned from all Unity churches. Uh, and the reason given was because the Course in Miracles was channeled material. And so we just heard the story of how one woman uh, basically you know, took all the Course books out of the, the church, out of the church library, and then she went on and she started taking all the Bibles uh, mm -hmm out of the church library too, and yeah. people were saying, oh, wait, whoa, whoa, what do you think you're doing? And she said, well, we, we heard that the memorandum came down uh, that the course was to be removed from the church because it was channel material, so we were just, she said, of course I was re removing the Bible as well because it's uh, channel <laughs> material as well. And so the definition, you know, it was, you know, we could say Matthew, Matthew Mark, Luke, and John, you know, the books that were passed down through the Bible, they were definitely inspired, but, but when you read those, they're, they're pretty deep. You know, it's, it's as if the Spirit is speaking a lot of the time, and the Spirit was obviously speaking through people. Even if you go back to the Old Testament, the, the prophets. And so, I think it's just a word that, that uh, sometimes has brought up some connotations, uh, because, maybe because there, there was this, stretch with the so-called New Age, where there was so many different channelings coming in from so many different entities and this and that, that, that almost something could arise like, is this bogus? Is this just uh, a bunch of people, you know, trying to make up a bunch of fantasies and say that it's, we're channeling Saint Germain or we're channeling so-and-so from the so-and-so galaxy or whatever. And, and it can be a fear reaction, but I think in a, a helpful translation of the word would be uh, to, to, it's an inspired use of symbols. And I think if inspired you... Inspired being in spirit. In spirit, just coming through in a very helpful, loving way. Like these songs, we're going to sing one, another one from Resta, and she felt like she would just receive these lyrics and she started hearing this music and then sometimes uh, harmonies that would go with it. And she was just recording it all. Uh, what she was hearing. And when she used to hear this years ago, she actually started hearing music and, and recording it. And she went to a music professor at a university and said, I think I'm, I'm getting this uh, music and I don't know what it is, but it seems like I'm receiving this music. And the professor said, what do you mean you're receiving the music? She said, well, in some way it's like it's, it's being composed or it's coming through me and I'm getting it, you know, it's finished piece of music and he said, no, no, you're not, you're not, you're, you must be, you must have heard a song on the radio or, you know, there was just nothing in his uh, awareness that really even allowed for such a thing. He gave her a lecture actually and said, no, 
to compose music, it takes a lot of training. You have to go through this course and that course, and, and it takes a lot of work before you can compose a music, a piece of music. And she said, well, I hear the whole thing. And he would say, that's just not possible. And so, with uh, joining with me in receiving all these lyrics and the music and the harmonies and everything, it was just a way of, of spirit, like using the symbols. And even to say, it's from the angels. I mean, again, people will say, well, what are the angels then? We have to get into another kind of religious yeah. term. And I would say that when Resta asked them, they said, well, we're kind of like, like tones. Um, you know, we seem to appear in whatever forms are comforting and helpful. You know, we may appear to some as like having wings. To others, it can be like your neighbor, uh, just a friendly neighbor who's there, or someone's there to help you on the spot. And you go, wow, that's, you're like an angel. You know, it's, it's used very loosely as just being symbols of help. Uh, because the spirit is invisible, but the spirit can use symbols to comfort us and to give us little signposts realize that we're moving in the right direction. So uh, that's, that kind of takes some of that connotation away from channeling. So let me, th and I think some of it's Hollywood too, you know. So I'm scary with these that question <laughs> asked and things like that. Um, but the, when, you, when you're speaking and you, you go in, inward or rely on spirit to, to talk through you, do you believe that is also a definition of channeling? No, I, I, I had a group of students back in the 1990s, and they, we got so into letting go of all concepts, including personhood, including levels of consciousness and realms and everything, that one day we got to the session and they said, what is this concept of channeling? It's like, it's like there's an entity somewhere, and then there's a receiver who, who like receives it like an antenna, so, oh, I'm channeling St. Germain, or channeling Buddha or Jesus or oh, I'm channeling Mother Teresa or something like this. And for me, I could see that that was just a symbol as long as you believe in persons and personhood and entities, then that's a symbol of receiving something that could be seen or perceived as, as wisdom or intelligence coming through like a, like a vehicle. Kind of like that St. Francis prayer, Lord make me an instrument. You might think of yourself still as a human being, but just as an instrument for spirit to use. But then the deeper you go, you start to feel less like an instrument even. You feel more vast, you have mystical experiences, and you feel connected. And, and so uh, I spoke at a church one time, the, the old church that I was raised in, and I just let it pour through one time, and, and there was this pause of silence. And finally one of the women said, who is speaking to us now <laughs> in this Christian church, United Church of Christ denomination. And I just smiled. Uh, I wasn't going to give it some name uh, and just, it was kind of more of like the Jesus thing of who do you say that I am? I didn't say it that way, I just smiled. And finally my biological father who was there right in front of his congregation turned around at all of them and said, Jesus is speaking to us now. And I was like, that's it. That's, that's officially the end of the world. Uh, you can imagine if your, if your biological father or mother in the front of their congregation said, that, that was Jesus speaking, I said, it's officially over. That, that is officially the end of the world. <laughs> Don't need any more proof. That was it, yeah. Yeah, because it wasn't even like, you know, channeling or saying anything, just that Jesus is speaking, and I was like, Whoa, that's, that's intense. It's a real moment. Yeah. So this song we're going to sing, we have, everybody's got the paper now? We'll come right back to questions and answers after our, our little sing along here. Come down, come down. 
from the cross. You have been dreaming a world of sad thoughts. Come down, come down from the cross. Like an Irish pub or something. Yeah. 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 There is no death that can ever defeat. One that is so holy and united with God's come down, come down from the cross. One that is so holy and united with God's come down, come down from the cross. Roll off your thorns, you're a lily of light. All our own minds that are one in the Christ. You've been mistaken, but it has no cost. Come down, come down from the cross. You've been mistaken, but it has no cost. Come down, come down from the cross. Let me go forth now and sing a joy song. There is no more and you did no wrong. Tell your brothers as you journey on. Come down, come down from the cross. Tell our brothers as you journey on. Come down, come down from the cross. Wow. Fast, you gotta really be attentive. Or you're all... It has that pause that tricks it. That's right. Yeah. yeah. That's a real mind trainer. Sing that 50 times. This is about not crucifying yourself. Yeah. Self-deprivation. Um, before the intermission, uh, I was having a spiritual catharsis. Just by being in your presence and sharing the material and the film, which is so powerful. Um, I was feeling lost and confused because I'm having, I was having an experience of, of my spiritual ego solving. And so uh, I thought I knew what ego is. I have many definitions as the false personalities, what we developed in order to survive your childhood. Uh, but now my mind is not able to hold on to any concepts. Uh, I don't know who I am, I don't know uh, where I am, and I don't know where I'm going, and uh, I don't know what ego is, and um, I'm, I'm needing reassurance about what is really going on. Yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's very articulate, you've really articulated it very well, it's almost like a dissolving or a disillusion of of a spiritual ego, which when we first look at those terms, spiritual ego, again, it's like it's oxymoron, a contradiction of terms, but the ego is so ingenious and sneaky that it loves the idea that it, it wants to come along on the spiritual journey. Uh, it wants to get in there somehow, even though the whole journey is designed to dissolve it away. It's, it's kind of feeling like, well, if you can't lick them, join them, you know, just that delay the journey by jumping on uh, piggybacking along. I have an attachment to thinking I'm a spiritual being, but now I don't know who I am. Yeah. And what that does is it, there's, it's a moment of disillusionment. It's almost, you could say, this feeling of disorienting and, and mm -hmm. like there's ambiguity with the whole thing. But that's what allows the spirit really to, to pour into our mind, is when we make a space, when we have an openness, and we start to come to this moment of not knowing who we are, instead of holding on to this fixed, firm definition. So, there's a part in The Course of Miracles where Jesus says, there is nothing that the world is more afraid to hear. So he starts it off with that, and I'm like, okay, what we, nothing the world is more afraid to hear. I do not know the thing I am and therefore do not know what I'm doing, where I'm going, or how to look upon myself or upon the world. And he says, and yet, in this, salvation is born. Uh, in this, we actually open our minds up, and instead of thinking we already know and holding to this definition, we let the Spirit pour through our minds and fill us up. So it's almost like you take the eraser out and you erase what was there, or you snap the cords, you know, the, the tethers that were holding, still keeping us uh, heavy in some sense, you know. We, we have moments of joy and happiness, but we still have these sad points that are like these tethers. 
and that sense of watching through the movies, that's, that's a powerful way because they're very, it's like a montage of, of metaphysical ideas pouring through, then you can snap some of these tethers and for a moment it feels very disillusioning and, and confusing even. But it's like, like your mind can then reorient and, and it's open to literally be filled with the Spirit. That the Spirit can speak to you and tell you of who you are and, and offer you experiences that will strengthen your awareness of who you truly are. Do I need to know what the ego is because I, my mind, can't that concept? Yeah. No, you don't. In fact, uh, during the break I was in there and, and we have another sing-along that we use and what it does is just meant to put this whole ego thing in context because you know it's like that old thing who's afraid of the big bad wolf as long as we think of it as this this uh, frightening and this terrifying thing or of this sinister thing um, you know it, it's not helpful we need to put it in perspective uh, even in psychological terms you know a lot of psychologists will say that you know there's just the tip of the iceberg that's above the surface and then there's this massive uh, ice block of ice that's underneath the surface and some psychologists will use that to describe the unconscious very daunting to think uh, oh my gosh what am I what am I up against an iceberg here you know you know what's my life going to be we have a song that we, we sing that kind of puts things into perspective and uh, in a way it's just it's kind of like uh, coming into your spiritual strength and your spiritual certainty and the vastness of who you are and singing a little song to the ego. So that's what we're going to do next. We're going to have, we're going to into our strength and sing a little song to the ego. Okay. And Helena will sing it first. Do we get to see the swivels, the hip movements and everything with this one? I hope. Uh, we'll see if it comes out. Uh, and then after she sings it, we'll learn it, and then we'll we'll sing it ourselves. It kind of puts the ego in perspective, so it doesn't feel so overwhelming. Mm -hmm.
think there's an extra line there in the end, too. You think you're real, but you are not. for a workshop where we sing this song. <laughs> She's gonna <have> howl. <laughs> That's right. Howl. Perceive everything as love or call for love, 
we are washing away that uh, doubt in our mind. We are, we are extending love over and over and over. So, you know, one thing you really don't want to do on the spiritual journey is, is start to get more in touch with what the ego is and start to point it out to others. Uh, that is definitely not helpful. <laughs> And you'll see how unhelpful that is <laughs> if you ever try it. But what it is, is, is if somebody comes to you and they're going much deeper inward and they say, please join with me and help me out. If you spot uh, something that is not of the spirit, if you spot ego, would you please help me and join with me and point that out. That's an invitation. But that's very rare. I mean, how many people do we know that walk up and say, if you spot any ego, you please point that out. It's very rare. So actually, most of what we do is simply going inward and recognizing calls for love and answering the calls for love. Even for ourselves. Even for ourselves. It's always, no matter how we define it, it's always a call for love. That's why it's important to be gentle with yourself. <laughs>